I'll uh, take a few moments to just uh, do a brief introduction. I think uh, all of you know Dr. Rapovich. Uh, Dr. Rapovich is an MD, PhD, who's uh, been with our MS Center for a number of years, and today is going to be presenting uh, a talk on autoimmune encephalitis. Um, this looks like it will be a really interesting talk that uh, an entity that we many of us encounter and often uh, difficult to diagnose and hard to can be very uh, difficult to treat. So really appreciate you covering this topic, Pavle. Thank you so much. And we look forward to your insights. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, let me share my screen so we can get started. I hope everyone can see this. I was impressed with this new graphic that the PowerPoint had, so I decided to include it, even though it's not directly neurological. Um, so my talk will be about uh, autoimmune encephalitis. We'll cover the definition, epidemiology, clinical and paraclinical features of this entity, approach to the diagnosis, um, and uh, cover some of the treatment paradigms. Uh, autoimmune encephalitis is a group of non-infectious immune-mediated inflammatory disorders of the brain parenchyma, often involving the cortical or deep gray matter with or without involvement of the white matter, meninges, or the spinal cord. That definition is from this publication in Journal of Neurology um, and Neuropsychiatry. Um, or yeah, <laughs> neurosurgery and psychiatry yeah, that came out earlier this year with some of the best practices in autoimmune encephalitis, something that I'll refer to actually throughout the talk. The autoimmune encephalitis was originally described as a perineoplastic syndrome uh, targeting the onconeural antigens such as anti-HU, YO, and MA. But more recently, some cell surface antigens have been identified and have in fact um, propel this field into a whole new uh, area. Uh, the uh, autoimmune encephalitis as an entity may be as common as infectious encephalitis, according to this study that compared uh, the prevalence that's in the upper panel and incidence of autoimmune encephalitis um, uh, and compare that to the infectious encephalitis. And as you can see here, if infectious encephalitis um, is set at one, the prevalence uh, of autoimmune encephalitis is pretty close to that. The two bars, the gray and the well, light gray and the dark gray, refer to the two time periods before 2005 and after 2006. And you can see that there's been a significant sort of recognition of um, these entities after 2006. <clears throat> um, in terms of the um, types of uh, autoimmune encephalitis, um, this graphic shows you kind of the timeline of how this field developed. So from the very earliest description of anti-HU in 1965, the next 40 years were mostly spent identifying a handful of these intracellular uh, onconeural antibodies. But then from 2004, with the discovery of aquaporin-4, and especially 2007, with the identification of the NMDA receptor as a target of one of the most common types of autoimmune encephalitis, the field has really grown exponentially so that now you have this alphabet soup of intracellular cell surface um, and synaptic targets. Uh, many of which, those marked with an asterisk, have commercially available assays, but not all. We'll cover some of those, some of the features of the most common types of the autoimmune encephalitis uh, first. And I promise I'm not going to take you on a sort of wild goose chase of covering every one of these entities. Uh, that's really not the goal of this talk. It's more to give you an overview of some of the more salient features and commonalities, uh, recognizing that this field continues to evolve. Uh, and there will probably be more to say about this in a, in a few years. But NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis is worth starting with because it was one of the first uh, cell surface uh, antigens recognized um, and, and as a different type of uh, encephalitis compared to the perineoplastic 
uh, and the validities that were dominating the field in the preceding 40 years. So it was first recognized in 2003 in a small series of about three young women. Um, and Dr. Joseph Dalma was instrumental actually in that early, in those early stages and continues to be sort of the giant in this field. NMDA, since then we've learned a lot more about NMDA. Uh, autoimmune encephalitis, uh, it predominantly affects young women with a ratio of three to one between females and males. The graph on the right shows you the age prevalence of where this is most common. So typically 20s and 30s. Um, and the red is showing you the female patients and blue is the total patients. There's a recognized association with ovarian teratoma. The green line shows you how many of these patients had ovarian teratoma. Uh, and increasing recognition that sometimes it's not teratoma, but preceding herpes encephalitis that triggers NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis. This was popularized in a book, Brain on the Fire, by a New York Post journalist, and that subsequently made it into a Netflix movie. So if you want to see that, you can. It's a little bit um, harsh to watch because this young woman was dismissed by many medical professionals, including neurologists, through her journey. So it's a bit humbling. Uh, but um, it is um, um, her account of, of her and tough journey with this. The typical presentation of NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis is with psychiatric features followed by a movement disorder or disorders and dysautonomia. That timeline is better shown on this slide where there is a viral prodrome that for all intents and purposes can look exactly like encephalitis or meningitis followed by the um, neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms including delusions, hallucinations, mania, agitation, changes in speech or disorganization um, that lasts on average one to three weeks, but it can be variable, um, that can then progress if untreated into movement disorders, um, dysautonomia, hypoventilation, seizures, and coma. The recovery is um, slower usually than the onset, and it can take months or years and may or may not actually be complete. The presentation, the presenting features of the NMD or autoimmune encephalitis are represented here with a pie chart. So the most common presenting features are behavioral change and seizures, but that changes over time or rather with age. So that in the youngest patients, the seizures are pretty very, very common, but in those older than 18, it's actually behavior, behavioral changes that are the most common presenting symptom and seizures are relatively less common cognitive changes, memory deficits, speech disorders, and other sorts of things fill out uh, the remainder of the, uh, of the presentation. 75% of NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis patients are thought to present initially to psychiatrists. This is based on the analysis of these 464 individual reports and trying to separate those um, psychiatric presentations from perhaps not purely psychiatric presentations, they've developed this network um, of interconnected symptoms such as, and I'm sorry if this isn't projecting very well, but such as agitation, aggression, hallucination, and so forth. And they've identified this cluster of seven features that cross higher level categorizations. Those seven features are agitation, aggression, hallucinations, delusions, mutism, irritability or mood instability, and depressed mood. So this uh, complex transdiagnostic psychopathology was fairly consistent among these patients and in, um, and, and at least in this article in Lancet Psychiatry, the authors made uh, a point of trying to recognize this as somewhat unusual than the typical psychiatric uh, new onset presentations. More dramatic presentations and features of NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis include oromandibular dystonia vocalizations and opistothonus, which are then actually shown, um, demonstrated on this video. <clears throat> um, 
and I'm sorry, it's a bit of a slow video, but I'll call out these features as, as they turn up. So there was that oromandibular dystonia. Localizations. And then there is the opistophonus, um, which is the arching back that you can see on these next few slides. And what I wanted to highlight here is a remarkable improvement in the patient's uh, symptomatology following the teratoma removal five days after the surgery. Another feature that can be seen with NMDA receptor encephalitis is the extreme delta brush on EEG tracings as shown here. The other autoimmune encephalitis prototype I wanted to, to highlight was the LGI-1. I think this stands for leucine-rich glioma inactivated. That's what the LGI acronym is for. Um, and this molecule actually was previously considered to be um, voltage-gated potassium channel uh, autoimmune encephalitis. But then later they realized that actually these non-specific, that the, the voltage-gated potassium channel binding was not always uh, specific, and it in fact comprised two entities, LGI-1 and CASPER-2, plus a number of non-pathological bindings. So then they cleaned that act up a little bit. So now when you order these panels, they test specifically for LGI-1 and CASPER-2. Now, LGI-1, unlike NMDA, predominantly affects men, two to one, older, quote unquote, <laughs> older than 50. And the hallmarks of LGI-1 autoimmune encephalitis are facio-brachial facio dystonia or dystonic seizures, amnesia, uh, disorientation, and, and other seizures. And hyponatremia is a pretty common finding in 60% of these patients. Cancer association with this autoimmune encephalitis antibody is actually pretty rare, but there is a striking genetic predisposition with 90% of patients positive for HLA DRB0701. But this is not a considered uh, an inherited disorder. So, as an example uh, of these fasciobrachial uh, dystonic seizures, you can see this video. You'll pay attention to the left side. Um, And so there are several of these that you can see through the video. The interesting thing about these is that EEG may in fact be completely normal during the events. So it uh, relies on a clinical recognition, uh, which is not perfect. Um, they've done a study recently where many of these actually were not recognized in the clinic. Um, I forget exactly the percentage. So the targets of autoimmune encephalopathy uh, or encephalitis are many and diverse. And again, it's not my goal here to, to um, uh, overwhelm you with these, um, but I do want to highlight just a handful of them and their features. So for anti-HU, there is a sensory neuropathy, neuropathy plus um, sometimes myelitis, encephalomyelitis presentation. With MA2, uh, this is typically seen in men younger than uh, 45. This, in addition to limbic encephalitis, can uh, include failure of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, 
narcolepsy, cataplexy, or severe rigidity. LGI1 we covered. GABA B receptor um, has prominent seizures. Sometimes these patients present in uh, status epilepticus. Uh, some have cerebellar ataxia. AMPA receptor can be marked by um, uh, marked sort of rapidly progressive dementia or pure psychosis. Um, and GAD is kind of tricky because it's not always specific, especially in lower titers. This is GAD65 protein. Uh, this, um, and then norexin 3A shows an overlap with NMDA receptor encephalitis. So these are commonly associated with limbic encephalitis, unlike these where limbic encephalitis is relatively rare. So the CV2, formerly known as CRIMP5, shows uh, is associated with uveitis, retinopathy, optic neuropathy, um, chorea and peripheral neuropathy. CASPER2 is more commonly seen with Morvan syndrome, hyperhidrosis, um, neuromyotonia, neuropathic pain. Uh, DPPX has a prominent diarrhea and gastrointestinal dysfunction and loss of weight. Um, in addition to all the other features, GABA-A um, is um, sort of multifocal. GLU-R5 is not all that unique, nor is adenylate kinase 5. And GFAP, which in fact wasn't described at the time of this review in 2016, um, can look like NMO with longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis and has this very unusual MRI pattern of radiating perivenular enhancement on MRI. So when do you suspect autoimmune encephalitis? Primary clue to this is rapid, meaning less than three months, development of confusion, working memory deficit, mood changes, and often seizures. Short-term memory is definitely a hallmark feature of this. In this recent review, they proposed classification of autoimmune encephalitis based on its location into limbic, cortical, subcortical, striatal, diencephalic, and so forth. In terms of serology, they can be separated by antibodies to intracellular antigens. These are the classical onconeural antibodies, ma, yo, hu type. And then um, secondly, antibodies to surface antigens with high clinical relevance, NMDA, AMPA, LGI, and so forth. These are considered to be most amenable to treatment, so they're most critical to be recognized. Uh, antibodies to surface antigens with questionable clinical relevance, VG, uh, voltage-gated potassium or calcium channels. And then last sort of bucket category are seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. And in terms of etiology, they can either be idiopathic, Perineoplastic, meaning associated with an underlying tumor, post-infectious, especially after herpes virus encephalitis, or iatrogenic, specifically with the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors or TNF-alpha inhibitors. So uh, the emphasis here is on clinical presentation because very often the antibodies are not available in real time. So categorization into limbic and uh, cortical subcortical is cognitive psychiatric and seizures, striatal is movement disorders, diencephalic is autonomic and sleep disorders, brainstem encephalitis like Bickerstaff encephalitis, craniobulbar presentation, um, cerebellitis will be ataxia, meningoencephalitis will have a clear meningeal signs, encephalomyelitis can have stiff person syndrome, spinal presentation or optical spinal presentation, and then there are peripheral presentations as well with sensory motor, autonomic, or myasthenic findings. And then, of course, the alphabet soup of different antibodies on the right. So, when approaching a patient with possible autoimmune encephalitis, it's valuable to at least keep in mind these diagnostic criteria for what is a possible autoimmune encephalitis. This diagnosis can be made when all three of these criteria are met. So a subacute onset, less than three months of working memory deficits, psychiatric symptoms or altered mental status, and at least one of the following, new focal CNS finding, 
seizures not otherwise explained, CSF pleocytosis with vital cell count greater than five, and MRI features suggestive of encephalitis, and of course, reasonable exclusion of alternative causes. Now, three-month window is recommended, but chronic presentation is possible with some of these. Monophasic course is common, but occasionally it can be progressive or relapsing. History of cancer or cancer risk, such as elderly age, smoking history, rapid weight loss should also perhaps raise the possibility of this. Use of immune checkpoint inhibitors, TNF alpha blockers, and preceding viral infection. All of these are kind of uh, background information that is worth recalling. Now, what are the typical MRI findings? So it, when you suspect possible autoimmune encephalitis, what sort of workup should one do? So the MRI obviously would be one of the first investigations. The typical limbic encephalitis finding is shown in A. The cortical subcortical features are shown in B. Uh, the striatal encephalitis is shown in C, and you can see some of the involvement here in the caudate. Um, the diencephalic findings are shown here. Brainstem is pretty subtle here, I'll admit. And then meningoencephalitis, of course, also pretty subtle uh, in, in panel F. Of these, only panel A is sufficient to diagnose definite autoimmune encephalitis in the absence of a defined autoimmune antibody. Uh, MRI is also important to recall, can be normal. And in that case, you, if the clinical suspicion is high, it may be repeated a few days later, and then it may show abnormalities. And there is considerable data that the brain FDG PET is more sensitive and more, you know, becomes abnormal earlier than the MRI. Of course, obtaining brain FDG PET can be challenging. What are you looking for on FDG PET? You're looking uh, for bilateral temporal hypermetabolism in several types of autoimmune encephalitis or occipital parietal hypometabolism in an MDA on uh, autoimmune encephalitis. And of course, seizures and meds we use uh, in these patients can sometimes alter the you know, metabolism. Other than MRI, what else can you do to investigate possible autoimmune encephalitis, EEG? You're looking for focal slowing or seizures, lateralized periodic discharges, extreme delta brush, but it can be normal, including in these facio-brachial dystonic seizures. So normally EEG doesn't rule out autoimmune encephalitis, but it can be helpful in a person who presents with primary psychiatric disorder, um, um, and there's been actually quite a bit of uh, contentious correspondence going on recently about getting these EEGs in newly presenting psychiatric patients. CSF uh, analysis is invaluable in uh, figuring out uh, the, the causes of autoimmune encephalitis. The typical tests that uh, should be sent are cell count and differential, protein glucose, MS profile, that's at least what it's called in our version of EPIC, including IgG index, synthesis rate, and oligoclonal bands. Broad viral studies, um, such as HSV1, VCV, bacterial and fungal cultures, cytology and flow cytometry, and then one of the panels for neuronal autoimmune antibodies, NAAs. So autoimmune encephalopathy or encephalitis panel. If possible, it's a good idea to save some of the spinal fluid for future analysis. And if this clinical suspicion is high, you also want to send a prion um, disorder panel, but this will delay processing of the sample, so be careful how you order this. The common findings on CSF in autoimmune encephalitis are lymphocytic pleocytosis, 20 to 200 cells, but it can be significantly higher with some of the antibodies, elevated protein, and sometimes oligoclonal bands or elevated IgG index. These neuronal autoimmune antibodies uh, should be tested in both serum and CSF. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to test this as a panel. You really don't want to send a single neuro 
um, neuronal autoimmune antibody test ever because these clinical presentations are so overlapping. So the panel is the way to go. CSF is more sensitive for some types of autoimmune encephalitis, such as NMDA and uh, gliofibrillaryositic protein, GFAP. But serum can be more sensitive for others, such as LGI-1, AQP4, or onconeural antibodies. So both CSF and serum are best to be sent. And this is recommended if the clinical suspicion is high, even if the CSF findings are otherwise normal. So even if there isn't uh, abnormality in, in white blood cell counts or um, protein. This matrix is confusing, I will admit, but it's also very helpful. What this is, is um, a snapshot of different panels uh, available at Mayo Medical Labs. Um, the name of individual panel is here on the left. The individual antibodies that are being tested are listed across the top. By comparing them, you can see that the encephalopathy serum and CSF, sorry about that, um, that the encephalopathy panel, uh, both in serum and CSF, is the most comprehensive test you can order. It is not 100% inclusive of every single antibody, but it is the single best shot you have. So in my practice, I don't really order any of the other unique antibodies because I think, again, this will give me the most bang for the buck. I also don't order anything perineoplastic because you'll compare here the perineoplastic panels they don't have NMDA, they don't have LGI, AMP, AGAVA, and a few of these other ones. They do have some of the antibodies, including this dirty, quote unquote, VG complex, uh, voltage-gated potassium channel complex. So I don't find these useful at all. And I don't think we should be ordering perineoplastic panels in people for whom we're suspecting autoimmune encephalitis. Um, but I do, look at CDS1, which is a CNS demyelinating disease, because that includes aquaporin-4 and MOG antibody. So um, one other comment I want to make about this investigation is that anti-MA2 or anti-MA or anti-TA is not part of this panel for reasons that have to do with patent protection and such. This is not available to testing at the Mayo. This is done at a different uh, lab. How are the neuronal autoimmune antibodies detected? Um, they're either using transfected cells. So here are the HEC-293 cells transfected with LGI-1. So you pick the antibody that way, and this is what the staining looks like. It can be done by staining primary rat neurons. This is what the NMDA pattern of staining looks like, or it can be done by looking at mouse brain sections and individual, um, and this is immunohistochemistry. So individual antibodies can give you different patterns of staining. So NMDA receptor pattern is shown here. Anti-GAD is shown here, anti-HU, amphiphysin, flotillin, GFAP. And then there is this. They will have every so often a situation where an unknown pattern, or maybe not an unknown pattern, but they'll see a pattern, but it won't be from a confirmed or, or known antibody. And this can be incredibly useful to us in the clinic when deciding what to do with these patients and how firmly to establish the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. However, they will never report this on a standard um, uh, results that are returned back to the institution. The only way you find out something like this happens is if you actually call Mayo Lab and you talk to them and you say, I really think my patient has something, does this look like um, it could be one of the you know, unknown antibodies. And you'll be surprised. Sometimes they actually do find them. In fact, uh, 
six years ago, five years ago, I had a patient who presented in a February of that year with a symptomatology that really looked like an MDA receptor encephalitis. Um, and she was treated and we followed her in the clinic. And it was eight months later that I got a call from Mayo that they identified that she had anti-GFAP. She was one of the first um, dozen patients for whom this entity was described. Um, and they wanted to know obviously more clinical data because they were putting together a case series to, to characterize it. So sometimes this sort of work leads to the discovery of a completely new, new entity. So to summarize, the samples or the panels that should be sent uh, in my opinion, when investigating possible autoimmune encephalitis are ENS2, that's serum, ENC2, that's cerebral spinal fluid, sometimes CDS1, that's aquaporin 4 and MOG, and entimata, which goes to Athena. They all require miscellaneous lab ordering in EPIC and routing to Mayo uh, or Athena. I don't recommend using perineoplastic anything because the panels exist in EPIC, if you type in perineoplastic, you will see a number of things that you can order, but those panels are limited. They sometimes include as few as three antibodies, only three instead of you know, 20. And um, they route sometimes to commercial labs, which don't really bother to look beyond their limited scope. So if it's not one of those three, that's all you're gonna ever hear about that. They will never go on and put this on a, on a, on a rat brain or mouse brain slice and call you up later and tell you, you know, this could be actually something. So when you order this, these panels, confirm with our lab that the sample was received and routed appropriately to Mayo. This is especially important for outpatient orders because very often there are problems with this. Uh, for inpatient providers only, I, I may regret this, but I still think it's a good idea to consider ordering this under my name only because it has happened to me several times that Mayo runs these experimental uh, stainings and they, and they want to call us back, but they don't know who to call. And it's not maybe until a month or two later when I see the patient and I call them, they're like, oh yeah, we were trying to reach you back to let you know about this. So these unclassified antibodies, according to Mayo, are recognized at the frequency of six to seven per day. So they actually call six, I don't know how many tests they run per day, but they discover these with some regularity and identifying them early on can actually be very helpful to everyone involved and provide a better medical care. If you're not comfortable putting this order under my name, you can email me um, and let me know that you've ordered it so I can then try and, and keep a track of this. Again, <laughs> We'll see how this works out in the next few months. But I think we need to do something differently because um, there are considerable delays that result from the current workflow. The turnaround time for these tests is about two weeks. Um, they don't come back the way our normal lab results come back. So sometimes you have to set a reminder. Sometimes you, even with a reminder, how to hound the lab and track these results back. So it's a lot of work, but it's for a good cause because it sometimes helps us uh, establish the diagnosis. The results are scanned. They're not, they're under the media tab in all the rest of the scanned document, um, you know, wilderness, um, but they are usually there. And the reporting is confusing. So it may look like the results are finalized when they aren't, when only the sample was collected. So we have a lot of work uh, still to do on, on that front. But until then, I think this is a reasonable sort of intermediate solution. Um, in terms of serological investigations, um, I would suggest this antithyroid antibodies, toxicology screen, 
anti-nuclear and other autoimmune markers, immunoglobulins, monitoring sodium, especially for LGI-1 associated hyponatremia. And you do wanna collect these blood samples before either giving IVIG or plasma exchange because you may end up with false positive or false negative results if you do the testing after those interventions. Brain biopsy luckily is not needed very often. And there isn't really a sort of a unique finding just for autoimmune encephalitis, typically that includes T cell and B cell perivascular and parenchymal infiltrates, secondary gliosis, but that's not in and of itself um, specific. Now, cancer associations, the most common cancers associated with autoimmune encephalitis are small cell lung cancer, thymic neoplasm, breast cancer, ovarian teratoma or carcinoma, testicular teratoma or seminoma, neuroblastoma and lymphoma, right, mouthful. But it's not uniform across the AE spectrum. And some antibodies like the onconeural ones, HUMA and GAD are, well, not so much GAD, but HUMA, NMDA and maybe AMPA are commonly associated with, anti, uh, with cancers, but others uh, like LGI1 and, and MOG are in fact very rarely associated with cancers. Um, if the initial screen is negative, however, and it is one of the highly associated antibodies, periodic rescreening is advisable. So that screening, how do you do this? It's CT chest, abdomen, pelvis with contrast. That's the first pass but it has low sensitivity for early breast and testicular cancer. So if this is negative, then breast mammogram. And if that's negative, breast MRI. That's again, questionable if everybody needs to follow all three of these tests. It really should be dri driven by clinical suspicion. And then pelvic ultrasound or testicular ultrasound, so women or men, and potentially a pelvic MRI if the ultrasound is equivocal. These cancers can be very small. That's really important. And the other thing is the patient may be very disabled. Uh, their Karnofsky performance scale score can be really poor. But if the cancer is identified and the patient has autoimmune encephalitis, the traditional KPS cutoffs for intervention should really not apply because these patients can make remarkable recoveries. Um, so maybe pushing on our oncology colleagues to do something, even if the patient is significantly impaired in this particular situation is justified. And then if the CAT scan and ultrasound and other investigations are negative, whole body FDG PET can be helpful. But this, is potentially challenging and uh, as I'm finding out also on the outpatient side. The definite autoimmune encephalitis requires all four of these criteria. So the clinical presentation with subacute uh, uh, onset of symptomatology less than three months, bilateral brain abnormalities. Remember, this is the only MRI pattern that can make up for the missing antibody. And at least one of the following, either CSF pleocytosis or EEG abnormalities. Well, any one of these top three can be substituted by neuronal autoimmune antibody. So if you find the antibody, you don't need one of those three, but you still need the other, the other two. And the MRI abnormalities can be substituted by FDG PET abnormalities. So this flow chart is comprehensive. We don't have to go through it in full detail, but it walks you from the workup of possible autoimmune encephalitis to uh, whether it's a definite, uh, whether it meets that criteria. If it doesn't, whether you should be investigating demyelination, AQP4, MOG, and MDAR, um, and then going down to Bickerstaff encephalitis, and then going further on the next page down to cell surface, autoimmune encephalitis, Hashimoto's encephalopathy, ultimately settling down to this antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. If you've done literally everything else and you still really, really think a person has autoimmune encephalitis, then this is a possibility. And I will say that this is the most complicated entity that I treat. Uh, so it's the hardest thing to really know that you are not over-diagnosing um, and, and one that 
has created, frankly, a lot of um, concerns and maybe frustrations in the clinic where people um, are labeled with this without necessarily going through the whole uh, previous workup. So one has to be super, super careful with diagnosing antibody negative uh, autoimmune encephalitis. It exists, I admit, but it is, um, it is also a potential huge pitfall uh, and a red herring for other, other conditions. And um, what happens sometimes with these patients is that they're given steroids or empiric immunotherapy, and then they feel a little bit better. And then, then everybody thinks, oh, well, you're better. So that means you must have this condition, but there's really no objective readout um, that they're better. And so then we're stuck in this weird loop of, yeah, something we truly want to avoid. So if we're gonna do empiric immunotherapy in somebody like this, we want to do it only with very close neuropsych follow-up, objective metrics of response, and such. How do we treat autoimmune encephalitis? Sometimes intensive care level is needed for status, dysautonomia, respiratory compromise, uh, and empiric antibiotic antiviral coverage early on is warranted, obviously, until you rule out the infection. But immunotherapy, once infection is ruled out, should be instituted as soon as possible. Waiting for the antibodies is counterproductive and not recommended, especially because they take such a long time to come back. So often that initial trial of immunotherapy, uh, especially in a hospitalized patient, is done before we have a confirmation. Um, the first line therapy is usually intravenous methylprednisolone, uh, 1,000 milligrams a day for three to seven days. Um, the potential downsides here is if lymphoma is suspected, that could affect the diagnostic yield. Uh, IVIG is another option, potentially a better choice for NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis than the steroids, uh, or when steroids are contraindicated, but they do have their own potential thrombotic risk. Um, and they're certainly less effective against intracellular uh, targets. They may worsen hyponatremia. And then plasma exchange, five to 10 sessions every other day. Sometimes it's combined. So um, if that treatment, so steroids followed or combined with plasma exchange and or IVIG, if that treatment does not result in a meaningful clinical or radiological response, um, then we should consider a second line therapy. The graphs on the right show you modified ranking scale over the course of six months in patients who receive no treatment, where the you know, worst MRS6 is in the dark red and the MRS0 is blank. So you see people who have no treatment, some people have no treatment with milder presentation can improve, but those who received first line, which is steroids, Plex or IVIG, they certainly improve better. So there's really no reason not to treat somebody. Treatment is a good idea. First line treatment and response. But if the first line treatment fails, second line treatment should be used because if you don't, patients do poorly and um, on average recover less than if you do use the second line treatment. Typical second line treatments are rituximab, 375 milligrams per meter square weekly for four cycles or cyclophosphamide. Now, I should have mentioned, even when I introduced the steroids, that nothing about this treatment is FDA approved. So all of this is considered experimental, um, but there is plenty of data in the literature that it's beneficial. So the flow chart that um, I crafted based on this review in JNNP starts with evaluation whether the tumor is present or not. If the, present, if the tumor is not identified, then based on severity, you can choose to either go stepwise with the immunotherapies uh, or sequentially, or if the, um, if the autoimmune encephalitis is severe, you may combine them up front. And if there is no improvement, the second step therapy is rituximab. If there's no improvement after rituximab, then the patient can still be treated with cyclophosphamide and so forth. Um, if the tumor is identified, 
then you want to treat the tumor while giving them some steroids. As in the case that I showed you first, that video of the lady with NMDA receptor encephalitis, that can lead to significant improvement early on. But if there is no improvement, then you have to decide, does this look like a surface antigen autoimmune encephalopathy, in which case you go to the combined therapy rituxan, or does it look like intracellular antigen? If it's intracellular antigen, then we skip rituxan. Then we go straight to cyclophosphamide because those classic uh, autoimmune encephalopathies, uh, onconeural ones, they are not as responsive to rituxan but they might be responsive to cyclophosphamide. And if the cyclophosphamide doesn't work, then we reach for even more experimental uh, therapies such as bortezomib or IL-6 therapy and such. After treatment, whatever it is acutely, the patients need to start on oral prednisone. So abrupt withdrawal of immunotherapy will lead to a relapse. So everybody should be on one to two milligrams per kilogram per day of prednisone uh, after completing acute therapy, followed by a gradual taper with, of course, proton pump inhibitors, vitamin D, and prophylaxis against pneumocystis while they're on that high dose of prednisone. Anything greater than 20 milligrams a day for more than four weeks. So in patients who don't have an identified tumor, the risk of a relapse down the line is actually higher. So for them, continued treatment with either mycophenolate or azathioprine or something along those lines is recommended for one year with periodic screening for cancer. This is specifically for NMDA. That's why it's mentioned over the entire talk. Antipsychotics conventional antipsychotics can lead to neuroleptic malignant syndrome in NMDA. They're particularly sensitive to those. So ketiapine is a good choice. Dopamine blockade can exacerbate the dyskinetic and dystonic movements. ECT can be used, which can be helpful with catatonia. And the recovery occurs literally in the reverse order of how the symptoms presented and can be slow and incomplete. I'll conclude by highlighting just some of the sort of cutting edge work that we're really excited to be involved with. So among the therapies for uh, autoimmune encephalitis that are shown on this slide, the ones in green are the sort of classically used ones, right? Cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, immunoglobulin steroids, and plasma exchange. But the red ones include some of the newer ones. So there is an ongoing trial of CD19 targeting antibody and one that's about to get underway targeting the IL-6 pathway inhibition. IL-6, as many of you know, is involved in the maturation of B cells and ultimately production of the pathogenic antibodies. So blockade of the IL-6 has been already successfully used in at least one antibody-mediated uh, disease in neurology. It's used for NMO, where satralizumab um, has an FDA approval for that particular treatment. So what we're um, gearing up to start here at Swedish is that same um, treatment, satralizumab, uh, for NMDA and LGI-1 autoimmune encephalitis. We'll be enrolling patients with modified ranking scale of two or more within nine months of their presentation. They can either have been treated with only first or second line therapies. And they can be maintained on some of the background immunosuppressants like mycophenolate or azathioprine. Uh, but I'll, the, the two treatment arms will be satralizumab or placebo for two years. So putting it all together, um, how am I doing here on time? This best practice recommendation 13 point list summarizes essentially the approach to autoimmune encephalitis. All starts with a clinical suspicion. You don't start with just testing uh, for the panel. It starts with that clinical suspicion and likelihood, then MRI and EEG, lumbar puncture with, and blood test that are appropriate, potentially brain uh, FDG PET, followed by cancer screening, ruling out infection, empiric trial of immunotherapy, first line, steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange, potentially second line with rituxan or cyclophosphamide, 
and potentially things beyond that if, if needed, followed by the bridging therapy with PO uh, prednisone. So I just wanna conclude this talk uh, by highlighting also some of the mimics of uh, autoimmune encephalitis. So the first panel here shows you the clear case of autoimmune encephalitis, uh, but the second one was a glioma. And a third one was ADEM. And a fourth, this D and E are anti-MOG demyelinating disease. And F is a Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. So there are many things out there that can fool you. Um, one of them from my clinical experience was SUSAC syndrome that we initially misdiagnosed as autoimmune encephalitis because everything looked like autoimmune encephalitis, except the MRI pattern was a little bit odd and that turned out to be something else. So you have to be super vigilant not to overdiagnose this uh, or underdiagnose. So with this, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. My contact information is here and you're welcome to let me know um, about any other questions you have later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. This was a fabulous talk. And uh, I'm looking in the chat, don't see anything as of yet. Maybe you can see that question. Uh, there's a couple there now. Catherine uh, asked uh, for suggestions on how best to transition these patients from the inpatient to the outpatient setting. So prior to this, so often the inpatient neuro team, well, at least lately, uh, have been very good about emailing me when somebody like this is in the hospital and they're suspecting it. And I would encourage you to keep doing that. Um, and that's one way to, to ensure that prior to discharge, we know these patients are coming so we can see them. Very often they're not discharged you know, home, they're discharged to a facility because they can be, one thing I guess I haven't highlighted and those of you who've cared for autoimmune patients know is that these patients can be terribly disabled, trached and pegged and have spent time in the ICU in a really, really bad shape and then I see them in the clinic, you know, a month later, and they are, they're so much better. So um, it, it's pretty amazing, actually, the potential of their recovery. But the, the, I guess to answer Catherine's question, the best way to coordinate this is to let us know that someone like this is in the hospital when, when you're treating them for AE so that we can make sure they're on our radar and that the follow-up can happen. These days, it's actually easier to do these follow-ups since the remote visits are gonna become a standard. In the past, it was more challenging when they would go to a rehab facility and spend a long time there, um, but yeah. So that communication with the outpatient and neuroimmunology group is critical. Uh, Bonnie asks, what are some common checkpoint inhibitors that you run into that could be culprit? I, in fact, have never seen this personally associated in, in my practice where, and maybe we just haven't recognized them or, or they're treated somewhere else. But um, so I can't really tell you that I've seen a lot of this. Uh, pembrolizumab and um, nivolumab, I think are a couple where I've run into the CNS autoimmunity as a potential complication from this. Dana Farber Institute, somebody from there, I forget the name, published a really nice review of their extensive experience with this. So I would say that's probably the biggest um, series, case series of these neural complications of inhibitors. The nice thing about them is that they're reportedly extremely responsive to steroids alone. And then you still have to figure out, well, do you treat the tumor? You do treat the tumor because it's obviously critical, but how and with, you know, and that is, I think, a little more complex. Uh, thank you for the comments. How do you think an autoimmune, how do you think that an intracellular antigen, Jim Bowen asked, uh, might cause an autoimmune process? How does an immune system see the antigen? Does it imply there is a non-immune process? Great question. And the 
thing is actually it doesn't. So the intracellular antigen is a byproduct. It's, it's, it's a marker of the immune response to the you know, disintegrating cells. It's not the driver. And that's why the uh, immunotherapies are not so good in the intracellular antigen autoimmune encephalitis. That's why the critical aspect there is treating the tumor. Um, and, and yeah, so that's tricky. Now that said, those of you who remember your biochemistry or neuroanatomy or whatever it is, remember that GFAP is intracellular. How that, but in every other respect, GFAP encephalitis behaves like a cell surface-based encephalitis. So nothing about AE lends itself to easy answers, but um, so I don't know how the GFAP leads to this immune responsive encephalopathy, but it does. Um, Mike, interesting how it overlaps with mild cognitive impairment and progression of neurodegenerative disease. I didn't want to go into this in today's talk because I wanted to have a case and I ended up with too many slides as it is. Um, but there is a really nice summary of this. Um, and Nancy might have actually <laughs> opinions about it too, about these autoimmune dementias, autoimmune encephalopathies masquerading as dementias. Um, I, I think we should approach it carefully, keep it in mind as one of the possibilities, but definitely not go crazy and order this on every single patient with a cognitive impairment. But it's, it's striking how many of these patients actually presented with cognitive impairment. What's the, uh, Catherine asked, what's the occurrence of a false positive result on autoimmune encephalitis autoantibodies? It really varies actually. So um, depends on the autoantibody. So for GAD, it can be particularly troublesome, right? Anti-GAD can be uh, nonspecific. Um, and what's my approach when result, when clinical suspicion is low? I don't think I have a perfectly worked out approach, but be careful. Don't overread every single one of these antibodies too much. Um, if the clinical pattern doesn't fit, the antibody result can really guide you into some strange places. In epilepsy in particular, um, there is a, a rating. I didn't pull it up. I think it's called APE2 score autoimmune epilepsy um, score. I may, I may have misremembered the, 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 the acronym, but they have this score uh, where you know, you, you give a certain number of points for certain features of epilepsy, of a, of a clinical or historical presentation. And then based on that, you decide whether you should really even be testing for autoimmunity. I can share that uh, with you if you'd like. Um, yeah, and Nancy Chang, yeah, it's complex. <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, the thing is, because of this considerable improvement on therapy, everybody wants this. People with schizophrenia would much rather have this than schizophrenia. And that can make, or a dementia versus this. So that can make us all patients, families, providers, a little bit, you know, biased with wishful uh, and hopeful thinking. But yeah, so that, that is definitely a risk in overdiagnosing these conditions. Pablo, again, thank you so much. I think uh, when I hear you give this presentation, we're just all so fortunate to have you as a resource here at Swedish. It was a fabulous talk and super complex and interesting as well. So thank you so much for your coverage. And I think we're at time and uh, happy holidays, everybody. And uh, um, I think that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you. All right.